So we're going to turn now to Dr. Sherry Grace from York University. So she's online. So we'll just ask you to unmute and to share your screen. We can go ahead with your presentation. Great. Uh, okay. Can you see my uh, slides? Okay, everyone. Yep. yep. Great. Okay. Super. So let me just move that over. Okay, so thank you so much for inviting me to be here with you today. Um, I'm not a muscle health researcher, but um, I work in the cardiac area and um, I'm here to share with you kind of the broader pillar around um, knowledge translation, okay? So um, I wanted to kind of say, you know, what is your so what? And um, knowledge translation really has to do with you know, how, how excited do you get when you wake up in the morning about the work that you do and um, how can it make, make the world a better place? Um, so knowledge translation is the process of turning observations in the lab to clinic and community and from clinic and the community into interventions that improve health of individuals and the public. So this can be diagnostics, therapeutics, medical procedures, and behavioral changes. So um, if we think about kind of the, the, the flow of information and what we want to achieve, um, we really want to get to these impacts on, on practice, policy, and individuals as well. Um, and, you know, whether you're working here in the basic sciences or in clinical research, um, you know, there are these so-called death valleys that are colloquially known, colloquially known as death valleys where you know, information just dies and it doesn't move along um, to to actual implementation. And, um, you know, there's really a difficult uh, transition from the basic to the clinical and then, as uh, you can see, from the clinical to um, practice and policy. Um, some data suggests that it can even take up to 17 years. So if you can avoid these death valleys, um, it would probably take about 17 years to get from some basic research to uh, actual implementation. Um, some other studies have suggested for, for clinical research, it might take about 10 years at least um, for, for um, translation from, from that research to, to practice. So this isn't uh, something that you're going to be um, achieving overnight, and hopefully that helps you uh, wake up every morning and not feel um, that you're falling short, because this is a really it's a, a long game. <laughs> Um, I'm going to show you a couple of the theories um, and frameworks around knowledge translation to start, just so that we understand the concepts. And then at the end of the talk, I'm going to talk, um, I'm going to share with you some examples um, from the cardiac rehab area where I work. And then I'm going to end up with some just kind of final thoughts uh, for you as basic researchers um, that you might want to think about um, in, in relation to your own work. Um, so this is the um, Canadian knowledge uh, translation kind of framework that's put forward by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. It's called the Knowledge to Action Cycle. Um, and where basic research fits in is uh, really here. Um, so this is where we start is, is finding knowledge inquiry, building and, and finding the, the new information. And then that can lead to, um, uh, we, then we want to get to knowledge synthesis, right? So we know not one study, each study itself probably isn't translatable. Um, we need to have a replicability and generalizability in, in a certain finding. And um, by synthesizing knowledge through reviews, for example, uh, we can really uh, determine whether something is robust and then hence warrants translation. Where it does, we can then look at what tools or products um, or activities are needed to um, implement that knowledge into practice or policy or, or you know, personal behavior. Um, and so, yeah, so here you say you identify some certain problem um, and you need to know what important information, what, what valid information that's rigorously um, uh, developed, you, you might want to um, apply to that problem. Then you need to adapt that to your local context. And when I um, show you some of my examples, I, I can give you some examples of how we've done that. Um, you also need to assess barriers. So we, we, I'll show you some examples of that too. So, you know, sure there's knowledge and we want an outcome, even say, you know, tobacco use, for example. People know that they shouldn't use tobacco, but they still do. So you need to understand what the barriers are 
between that knowledge, right, and, and implementing that knowledge. Uh, you need to select, tailor, and implement your imp interventions and think carefully about how you do that. Um, then you need to kind of monitor and evaluate what you're doing. So uh, did the knowledge get to where you wanted it to go? Um, did the knowledge have the intended effect that you that you had? Um, can you measure that? Is that measurable? And you can um, take a look and I'll show you some ways that we've done that. And then you want to try and sustain that, right? So it's not a one-time uh, one time activity, but you want to keep sustaining that over time. And again, I'll show you uh, some examples of that from, from our own work. Um, so that's the Canadian, and this is actually well um, well respected um, internationally and, and um, groups in Europe, et cetera, will, will take a look at that um, Canadian as a real Canadian framework as a gold standard. Here's the NIH, which I think um, I, I show this because I do think it really um, places basic science uh, more prominently within the framework. Um, so you can see here, yeah, basic research, preclinical to clinical to implementation to public health. Um, so again, just kind of this flow of, of where things go. And again, you don't want these death valleys uh, between these um, elements. So you're really developing your approaches, uh, demonstrating your usefulness, and then disseminating them. So that's knowledge translation, and I want to distinguish that from implementation science, which you might have also heard of. And implementation science refers to the methods of how, so there's also kind of methods for KT itself. Uh, so you need the knowledge that you're going to translate, but you also have a science around how you translate it. And that science has burgeoned and exploded um, over the last decade or two, probably the last decade. Primarily. So implementation science is the study of the methods to promote the uptake of knowledge um, and other evidence-based practices into routine practice. So again, being a policy or care or personal behavior. Um, so as I mentioned, this field has exploded. And if you take a look at this field, um, you know, you, you're going to find a lot of different things. And so here I'm uh, frameworks and ideas and concepts. So I'm here trying to uh, synthesize this um, and, and make it a bit um, more tangible and um, uh, bite-sized for everybody. But um, a nice review came out a couple of years ago, and they kind of um, distinguished between three main approaches or, or ways of thinking about KT. And what I showed you uh, earlier from K uh, CHR and, and NIH were really kind of process models. So how the KT happens, what's this knowledge to action cycle. And now I'm going to show you some frameworks uh, or theories. So there's a lot of theory around how do you translate knowledge to practice? Um, what are the constructs that you need to uh, think about and, and uh, modify to get to where you want to go? And uh, so we'll summarize those. And then at the end, there's also frameworks around evaluation. So how do you know you got there, right? How do you know and can you demonstrate that the knowledge that you've translated is actually having the intended effect? So yeah, so let's take a look at these uh, frameworks or theories now. So this is a bit of a busy slide, but um, it shows you how busy and, and uh, multifactorial this, this is. So this is just a, a figure from a study where they were looking to implement um, an intervention to reduce sedentary behavior in the workplace. I've used this as an example because a lot of us are involved in um, physical activity or human movement. Um, and here they've used two main uh, implementation or knowledge translation frameworks to try to get to that outcome of reduced sedentary behavior. So the first one here in the left-hand column is uh, the theoretical domains framework. So the TDF or the theoretical domains framework is a really nice uh, conglomeration of a lot of literature. So as I said, there's this explosion in literature in this area and so many different theories and the theoretical domains framework tried to integrate them all. So in, you know, say one theory and another theory called the same kind of concept a different name, they would group that together. And so they ended up coming up with a list of 14 uh, domains that you might want to consider when implementing knowledge to impact behavior. And the point with this um, um, 
framework is that you would select which domains of the 14 are most relevant to you and then try and operationalize them to to impact those those domains so that you can um, improve your outcome. So here are just some examples. This isn't all 14, but you can see um, you need to think about knowledge, but not only knowledge, uh, memory, attention, decisions, processes, behavioral regulation, beliefs about capabilities to an active behavior change, beliefs about consequences of a behavior change, your intentions to change, uh, your social role identity, uh, reinforcements for a behavior, your emotions related to a behavior, your context and your resources and social influences, maybe friends or, or colleagues, for et cetera. So lots of um, factors that might influ influence someone's uptake of your knowledge and your recommended intervention. So that's a theoretical domains framework. Another one that's shown here is called the BCOM. So B is for behavior and the COM is for capability opportunity and motivation. So thinking about those elements and how they might need to be addressed so that you can achieve your intended outcome. Okay, so those are two main, um, and I just show it in a figure of like how it might work. But there are other two other main frameworks that I want, if you are interested in this area, that you might want to take a look at. One is um, CFIR, or the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research. And then the other one is Paris, promoting action on research implementation in health services. So if, yeah, if you're really looking to maybe, um, you know, you're developing an OGS application or a research, applica uh, research grant, um, it, is, it is useful to ground your KT efforts in a theoretical um, framework. And I would suggest that these uh, would be a great place for you to look in terms of which one you might want to um, apply in your case. So those are the, um, these are the um, uh, frameworks or theories. And lastly, we want to know, hey, did we get where we wanted to go? And for, for that, um, a lot of uh, folks look to this re-aim framework, which has been around for quite a long time. Um, I would say before all this explosion, and it, it has withstood the test of time. So re-aim stands for reach, effectiveness, adoption, implementation, and maintenance. So um, the um, reach is like, how many people did you get to? And was it as many as you wanted? Um, effectiveness, did you accomplish your goals? Adoption, um, what about, you know, say we wanted to change individual, we reached a lot of people that are maybe workers to change their sedentary behavior, but also adoption, how many workplaces itself implemented your, your um, suggestion? How many countries were those uh, workplaces in? Uh, implementation, so was there fidelity to the actual intervention as intended so that it would be most effective? And then maintenance, again, the question of is this sustained over time? Uh, a couple other <laughs> things or main concepts in the KT field are um, related to kind of the timing of when you do or when you engage in KT. A lot of KT that we think about typically is so-called end of grant KT or end of study KT. So, you know, we find something out and then we think about, um, you know, is this worth uh, translating into practice or, or, or change? And um, what, you know, how are we going to do that at the time? But now it's um, increasingly considered best practice to uh, start thinking about KT from the beginning. Um, so by integrated KT, they are referring to meaningfully engaging your end users. So maybe that's, you know, sedentary people in the workplace or it's the large organizations which, who have many sedentary workers due to, you know, computer work or whatnot. Um, so engaging them from the beginning. Um, so you know what their priorities are and what's going to be feasible to implement in their setting, what's important to them. And if they buy in to that from the beginning and they have that sense of ownership, there's a higher likelihood that what your findings um, turn out to be, if positive, are going to actually be implemented. Okay, so integrated and end of grant. Um, you also want to think about um, a multi-pronged approach to KT. So it's not really usually one strategy. 
Uh, it's often multiple strategies, and you want to think about your audience when you determine or, or select which uh, approach you want to use. So uh, we, again, we're probably all very familiar with academic KT. We're doing academic KT right now um, through this conference. Other academic KT, right, is publications. Uh, if you want to reach policymakers, um, probably you could publish in things like the Cochrane um, uh, collaboration reviews, so knowledge syntheses, um, but also probably one-on-one -on -one, uh, meetings because often policymakers aren't uh, very well educated on how to interpret evidence. Um, you want to, again, integrate, you want to engage them from the beginning. And um, other things might include letter or email campaigns to MPs. Um, and to, to reach the public, you might want to um, use mainstream uh, media, so press releases, and maybe you work with uh, media relations here at York to, to uh, develop these and post them on Eureka Alert, for example, and see if it's picked up by uh, traditional news outlets. You can also exploit social media, Twitter, and the like. Uh, patients, you might want to engage patient organizations, so Patients Canada, or in our um, case, we have like a cardiac health foundation, and um, or, you know, in heart failure, there's a Heart Life Foundation, and all the patients have like a, an online forum, and they communicate with each other, so you can reach you know, heart failure patients from coast to coast to coast that way. Um, the other thing you might want to do is um, you could develop a point of care tool. So, and then give that to all the specialists treating patients with the condition that you're maybe studying. Um, so getting like a lay guideline, so information that is patient-centered um, and a, an appropriate level of health uh, literacy for patients and get that to them through uh, specialists treating your your uh, patient group. And the last piece I wanted to talk about is kind of the holy grail of, uh, <laughs> of knowledge translation is this is the concept of scale up, scaling up your intervention. So uh, for example, we did a trial, we've done a few trials and we get grant money to run it for example, we did a trial on women-only cardiac rehab, and um, um, your grant runs out, and you don't have any money to run it anymore. So it generally stops. Like a lot of interventions, they might be shown to work, but you can't deliver them anymore because there are no more resources. So it's not a policy that that given intervention be um, administered and or, or offered, and so it just dies there again. So it's a, it's a death valley, right? Um, and so the holy grail is really being able to scale up and actually, if your intervention works, being able to implement it across um, the, the population or across a health system. So the Institute for uh, Healthcare Improvement has a, a, a framework around uh, how to do that. And so does the WHO actually, if you're interested in that. So, so those are kind of whew, a lot of uh, frameworks and um, concepts. So let's take a look at you know what this looks like in in practice. So cardiac rehab um, is the area where I work, and here you know it's an outpatient program for chronic disease management. So patients come and see us a couple times a week. Um, they have structured exercise, and then they get some education and counseling along with that. There are rigorous knowledge syntheses that show, you know, 25% mortality uh, reductions with rehab compared to usual care. The evidence is, it's very strong. However, most people don't end up using it. So we've been working on uh, how do we get them there, okay? So um, one of our studies called CR Care, we, we looked across the whole province on Ontario. We found out on... Uh, cardiac units treating patients who benefit from rehab, how, what kind of strategies were those units using to, um, to get patients to rehab? And they were doing things like using electronic records, so to, um, to kind of have reminders pop up to, to refer patients. Um, and they're also doing things like talking with patients at the bedside before they left. You know, you've been referred to rehab. It's important that you go. It's going to help you um, in these ways, right? Um, so we really showed that both of those strategies and those strategies together can increase the number of patients that end up using rehab. 
So we needed to translate that. And I've been working on different ways to do that for quite some time. So at our own institution, um, the kind of the concept of sustaining knowledge. So I've worked with the, I'm cross-appointed at University Health Network and it's a hospital group downtown. And um, over time, they have these changes in their health uh, information systems and electronic patient records. So we worked with IT to um, implement a, a, a trigger for cardiac rehab referral. And then their system changes and you have to go and <laughs> work with them again to update that. And so that continually, we're sure that the indicated patients, the patients who benefit, are referred to our program and we receive their information and can enroll them in the program. Um, we also did this kind of on a uh, provincial level. So um, he, we have a trial coming out in the British Medical Journal next month. And um, so here in Ontario, there are 18 um, hospitals that are designated with kind of advanced cardiac care. Um, so, and they have um, imaging uh, for the coronary arteries to see if people have heart disease or not. And so we randomized those 18 centers. So um, one third were just usual care. So however the hospital referred that, so be it. One third of the hospitals um, from the hospitals, we, we sent a letter to the patients and a letter to the healthcare providers saying, hey, this patient should go to rehab, why it's important, here's how you refer them, how you get there. And then another group got the um, letters, but they also got um, interactive voice response calls, so IVR calls. And, you know, did you get referred? Are you going to rehab? And if you get any no's, then a lay health worker would call them. And so we showed, too, that this resulted in more CR completion. It wasn't as much as we would have liked, but it was significant. And so now we're in discussions with Core Health, who is the advisory body to the Ministry on Cardiac Care, about keeping this going, right? So once the funding ran out, this stopped. And so we're talking with them now about how we can sustain that. Another thing that we did was um, work with the Canadian Cardiovascular Society to reach all um, uh, cardiac providers across the country to um, synthesize evidence and make recommendations about what's best practice and making sure that that is that inpatient referral and that discussion. Um, so we were approved by the Canadian Cardiovascular Society to develop a, a position statement or guideline under their um, moniker. And so that means then that this is, you know, going to be endorsed by them and it's going to be promoted by them, which would, um, again, if you think about the, you know, the the, um, who's giving out the information, it's that's important because people really value um, and give a lot of weight and credence to what the Canadian Cardiovascular Society says. Really exciting is that in the United States, they recognize the value of automatic referral and the House of Representatives passed a bill saying that hospitals need to implement this. So now the CDC and the um, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality is implementing automatic referral with a discussion at the bedside across hospitals in the US. Very exciting. My research was cited in the um, call for this and I was asked to be a subject matter expert to implement this. Unfortunately, it's on hold because of COVID, uh, but that's you know pretty exciting. Uh, we also did a, a knowledge synthesis, um, so with Cochrane, um, and then again, that's a real go-to place for uh, people who make policy decisions. Um, and then we translated that into clinical, tangible clinical practice recommendations for uh, healthcare providers. And this time we did this internationally. So last time it was Canadian, this one is uh, international. So we had um, people from around the world and we had this endorsed by 23 national or international cardiac societies and they worked with us to disseminate this information and help us implement it. And indeed, now they say, oh, you can't just put out a guideline anymore. You have to have a guideline implementation tool. The doctors see so many guidelines and they, they just don't have time to implement them. There are barriers to implementation. So we asked uh, cardia, inpatient cardiac care providers, what do you need to help you do these referrals and have these discussions? And, and you know, they said, we're really busy, but we have to do continuing education every year. So give us something that we can do for our continuing education credits. So we created a, a course 
and uh, we've uh, launched that internationally. Um, they also said to us, okay, that course was great, but I forgot everything once I was at the bedside with a patient. So we gave them a point of care tool they could download from within the course. And again, what we did was we worked with the Canadian Cardiovascular Society um, to recognize this. We got um, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Canada and also CPD UK to recognize this. And so this is posted on their website as um, um, endorsed or accredited for continuing education. So any doc or nurse that's looking for their annual uh, credits, they will look here and see our, our course as an availability um, option. So just to wrap up, uh, you know, what could this look like in basic science for you? Um, again, this is not my area, but uh, my thoughts are, you know, you could look at reviews of animal studies, you know, trying to reach other academics. You could share your discoveries with the public via mainstream and social media. You could collaborate with researchers across the globe that do the same kind of work, but maybe in a different cell type. Or, you know, how can you apply your findings to another field or another species? So thinking about that. And, and really, when you're, when you're thinking about KT, here are some main questions that you might want to think about. So what information should be transferred? To whom? Uh, by whom? Uh, how? And then with what effect? What is the outcome that you want to achieve? So really thinking about these bigger questions before you get out there uh, uh, and hit the ground running. But remember, a lot of important research, um, it was not readily translatable when they worked on it. So things like the science behind the x-ray, between behind quinine, behind the microwave, you know, scientific curiosity is important for its own sake because the, the findings that um, under underpin these weren't created with the purpose of, a, of, a, of an eventual outcome. Um, another um, issue is that some research isn't worth translating. So if you have negative uh, like null findings, et cetera, or something's not replicated, every little piece isn't worth um, translating. And again, it happens over a career. So you're not gonna achieve this um, over the course of you know, uh, six months or something like that. So there are some resources here, and we even have uh, resources at York, a great knowledge mobilization unit. They'll work with you. They have training, um, so you can reach out to them. And then finally, I'm very happy for you to reach out to me informally as well, as we don't have the opportunity with uh, COVID and being online. But um, if anyone would like to reach out, I'm very happy to, to help, and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Dr. Grace, a wonderful presentation. So a reminder for anyone, if you have questions to do so um, with the Q&A session, and if any of the panelists have questions, please feel free to ask them. Just to get us started, uh, one question I have for you, Dr. Grace, would be for advice for trainees. So if we're developing um, committee membership, we still wanna have the expertise and the depth in our area, but is there something we could do kind of along the wayside as we're starting up through degrees to, to implement some, some integrated KT throughout our projects? Yeah, that's a, that's a good, uh, good point. So I, I would say that, um, you know, a lot of faculty and a lot of supervisors now have KT in their toolkits uh, because uh, whenever we submit a grant, we have to think about this from the outside. So hopefully your supervisor um, has some uh, knowledge and experience in the area and you can have some nice discussions with them about it. Um, but again, if not, I would really look to your institution where you're working and, and see if they have a knowledge translation unit so that you can learn about this um, on your own and maybe bring it to your committee or think about, yeah, your other committee members and, and maybe, you know, maybe your supervisor doesn't have this as a, as a skill set or, or, but someone else might, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, Sherry, uh, nice presentation. I really like that uh, emphasis on the knowledge translation, of course. And, uh, um, you know, you said a skill set, and it's definitely a skill set that's required. And every time we write a grant, of course, as you said, we have to write something about that. And I'm trying more and more with my own trainees to emphasize how, how very, very important it is for us to be able to you know, translate our, our animal models and our animal research and even cell culture research, and if it can coincides with the animal stuff, into translational uh, information that people can 
can really use. So you're absolutely right in, in your emphasis. And um, you must be very proud, actually, of the international reach that you and your colleagues have, uh, have done in this field of cardiac rehab. It's quite impressive. Thank you very much. Yeah, I didn't get to show my second example, but we've been, um, one of our guidelines has been adopted by WHO and is going to be implemented in all member states as well. So we're really, really excited about that. But it's, you know, it's been 20 years in the making, right? So everyone has to remember um, that it, that it's long term. And, um, and, and as I said, I'm coming from this at a, as a clinician. So I only have one death valley to overcome. Whereas a basic scientist, you have these two death valleys <laughs> to get over. Um, so, so everyone, you know, go easy on yourselves and uh, try your best. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hope that the WHO has enough funding to keep uh, <laughs> propagating that. And uh, despite the U.S. withdrawal or threat to withdraw, that there's still uh, plenty of WHO support out there. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you. I have a quick question, if you don't mind. This is Heather Edgel. Yeah. Hi, Heather. Hi. Um, do you have any advice for students who, uh, social media is obviously very growing and students are very proud of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice on how students can avoid pitfalls, like giving false advice or bad advice out there on Twitter or whatever? Well, yeah, this is, <laughs> that's a very good point. Um, so, yeah, I guess I would, I would just again, caution that all, all findings from every individual study aren't necessarily translatable. And so um, we all want to be proud of our work, but I think we need to remember to place it in the context of the broader literature. And, um, you know, when you're obviously writing up a paper, you have to place your work within that broader field. So if you are promoting something on, on social media, I would suggest that you maybe mention how it's consistent with some other work or, um, you know, make sure you're clear about limitations. And it's hard in a small tweet, for example, but um, even if you have a link somewhere that, that highlights limitations. Uh, but, but um, yeah, there is a lot of concern, too, about uh, media releases, for example, in animal studies. And um, it looks like there's, you know, maybe, for example, some really promising cancer treatment. But it's in an animal. It's in the animal models. And a lot of the work done in animal, animals doesn't translate. Maybe, what do they say? It's like 5% actually make it to a viable treatment in humans that, that gets uh, you know, passes the FDA or Health Canada. So I guess really being clear that, you know, your study maybe is in animals or in cells, um, any limitations um, in that in that short little snippet that you can um, manage to get out there. <laughs> Thanks very much. Great. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Grace. Quick question. Oh. So, sorry, quick, just a comment, uh, because I we have a lot of students uh, hearing us here. Um, I I mean, one comment I don't want anybody, our, there is a difference between our research translatable and important. Yeah. So important research sometimes cannot be translatable immediately, but also cannot be translatable, period. I agree there. But I don't want that people misunderstood your uh, conclusion that when it's not translatable, meaning that it's not important. It can be important yeah. to give us knowledge, to understand mm -hmm. a mechanism, but that protein you are studying is not necessarily a target for a drug that will cure a disease. But doesn't mean it's not important. Just that's uh, yeah. a distinction which is important to make. Yeah, so that's where I really wanted to highlight here that so many important discoveries have been made. And um, you're right, it wasn't translatable at the time. But that scientific curiosity uh, was fundamental um, and, and exactly very important. So mm -hmm. thank so you. Very good information for us to consider that our work's still good, but we'll we'll make it through and we'll make something bigger of it at some point. Mm -hmm. So thanks, Dr. Grace and Dr. Gluzzi. Um, so I'm just going to give us a 10 minute period break here. I don't know, Dave, if you have anything else you'd like to add, but uh, Dr. Grace, if I can get you to stop sharing your screen. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, uh, that's very good. Thank you, Heather. Great job. I'll just share my screen. We have about eight minutes for a break. Uh, eight minutes, and uh, we'll come back precisely at 12.30. See you then. <laughs>